fantastic. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming along to my session today. I really thought there'd be no one here considering the five o'clock time slot, but uh, yeah. Guys, if you want to still come in, there's like room down here. You can sit on the stage if you want. I want to pack all these sessions out just so the, uh, the dev guys can get bigger rooms next year. That's, I, think, I think it's very important. Um, importantly, who's got business cards here? I should have tweeted this. Has anyone got business cards? Yep. Uh, I'm not sure how we're going to do this, but I've got a, uh, a $2,000 piece of software to give away. So um, maybe someone can go and collect all the business cards for me, give them to me, and we'll, and we'll do a, a, a random draw at the end of the session, and someone will win them, okay? So can anyone do that for me? Nat, can you do that for me? It's very important. You know, it, help, it helps spruce things up at the end of the day. So, all right, all right. Let's get started, guys. So, uh, my session is MVC lessons learned from being burnt. Um, this is me, Malcolm Sheridan. I work for ANZ. I, I, I am a quantitative project leader, which means I, I delegate work to uh, a lot of developers these days, which is quite nice. And uh, being a, a quantitative person means uh, I'm in charge of people with uh, PhDs in small pieces of mathematics. So they're really like really geeky. Like we, we think we're geeky, we're not. We're really not. And uh, what I'm going to tell you about today, I'm not going to actually tell you everything that we did in the project, but I thought this session was going to be good. Instead of doing a, a talk on, you know, what's new and cool in MVC, I thought it would be more beneficial to do a talk on things that we learnt by doing a, a large scale project. Um, you know, whenever we do a project, we think we're doing things the right way first then you realise you know, there are better ways of doing things. And that's where this talk's really coming from. Um, I'm a MVP. I'm also a Telerik insider, which is pretty cool. So I don't work for Telerik, but I pimp their products as much as I possibly can. So I did mention there was a, a giveaway. Oh, actually, before I do the giveaway, um, I've just got to read this, OK? Uh, everything I say in this talk today is my view only. It's not ANZ. Uh, ANZ are very, very good for letting me come and talk to you guys, but they're not, they haven't got anything to do with this talk. So everything I'm talking about today is just me, okay? That's out of the way. All right, Telerik. I've got one Telerik Ultimate Collection to give away today. It's worth $2,000. Uh, so when we go and collect the business cards, that's how we'll do the draw. So everyone will get the business cards. We'll do a draw at the end of it. Um, already had a, a MSDN subscription to give away, but someone's already taken that off me today. So um, unfortunately, you guys missed out. But Telerik are a great company. Who here has, has used their products before? Oh, fantastic. Fantastic. Do we love it? Do we love Telerik? Yes. 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 <laughs> yes. yes. That's a big yes. <laughs> Dev, yeah, uh, DevExpress are good. They've expressed the good. But uh, that's what we're going to do at the end of the day. All right, so where's this talk come from? So basically, <coughs> we were contracted by NZ to build an intranet website, so hence I can't show everything that we've done. Um, roughly about 45,000 plus users, multiple web servers. We've got about nine web servers all up. So uh, I did a talk on deployment strategies uh, a while ago. That's sort of what we did with this website, but that's not going to be the talk today. Um, so things we did wrong, things we did right, sorry, that should be things we did right, but then worked out a better way of doing it. So you know how whenever you do a project, you think, oh man, I'm doing things the right way, and then you learn, oh, there's actually a better way of doing that. So we're going to be going through some of those, those issues that we, we worked along, and it's all in MVC3. All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to be talking about uh, handling exceptions, Ajax exceptions, uh, action filter ordering. Uh, we had uh, a case where we had uh, one form doing multiple form submissions. That was really interesting. Um, some random constraints, uh, controller action evokers, and security. So this talk is a level 300. We're gonna, so we're going to start uh, at the you know, very beginning and then just work our way up to something more advanced. So if you think the, the talk starts out too basic, just hang in there. Just hang in there. You know. It's like the Collingwood Football Club. They will eventually win the flag. So... <laughs> All right, so we're going to start off with handling errors. So uh, 
How many Webforms guys have we got in here still? Oh, that many, wow. So the, the Webforms guys. Um, so this is not going to be a, an intro into MVC, so hopefully you, know, you get the concepts. But with error handling, error handling is done a little bit differently in MVC. So you've still got your custom errors in your web.config file, but you can handle errors at the controller and action level, which is really cool. So you can do logging at a fine grain, fine grain level or at the controller level. And with MVC3, we, we can do uh, global filters as well. It's a really, really cool thing. Uh, so let's have a look at a, a project that I've got earlier. Where, hang on. I can't see my screen, sorry guys. So I'll open up Studio. And uh, eventually we'll get something open. All right. So the website that I'm going to show you today is very basic, but it's the concepts that I want you to take away from this. All right, run the project. And I'll split this up into eight different sections, I think. So that's what we're going to cover today. Okay, so error handling, lesson one. So I mentioned error handling. You've still got the, the web config custom errors section, because as we know, whenever we build websites, we, or whenever, whenever we build applications to our users at the end, and some users are, are very, very um, silly. Silly about that. So they can type in actions that don't exist. So I've got a, a, uh, an action that doesn't exist, and we get the you know, 404 error. So the best way of dealing with this is by adding the custom errors to our web config file. Uh, where are we? Did I click in the right one? I think I opened up the wrong file. So, very, very similar to web forms. The only difference is, in MVC, we don't actually go back to a, a file, like you do with web forms, so we're going back to an action. So, we've got an umbrella action for you know, when we encounter really, really silly people. We've got a, a 404 error for pages not found, and a 403 error for actions that people shouldn't be seeing. So, if we have a look at the controller for this, these all map back to the umbrella action. Everyone can say the font okay. Is it big enough? Yep. 404 and 403. So if I save this now and I come back in here and I'll refresh the page. Click on errors and now we're taken to a, uh, you know, an error which says, you know, you've done something stupid, fix it up. So that's at the web config level, but sometimes you want to handle errors at the action level. So scenarios that you want to do this, or we found that you want to do this, is when you want to have uh, logging. So you might want to have logging when someone comes in and they haven't got access to this or they're doing something they shouldn't be. We can log everything in here. So we come back into our controller. We've got a, an action called just throw an error. So this is just throwing an exception. So I've got a action. Sorry, it's called log error. I've got an action filter here. So everyone knows what action filters are. They're your friend whenever you do anything in MVC. So action filters basically allow you to intercept requests and do things like uh, returning different results, for example. You can, you can uh, execute an action before an action, an action is executing, after it's executing, all that sort of stuff. So if we actually have a look at log error and see what's happening here, 
we've just got a, a class and it's derived from action filter attribute. So whenever you do anything with a, an action filter like creating a custom one, you need to derive from action filter attribute. So that's the base class for all action filters. And this one, I'm Im implementing the interface I exception filter. So that's just going to give me details about the exception. And this is where you'd have, if you're using you know, something like log for net or Elm or something like that, you'd have logging in here. Do all your logging, get out. Um, so if we just put a breakpoint on this, and I'll just build the website now. I'll click on this. Oh, what's it done? Hang on. Log error. I'll just run this. All right, so it's going to throw an error and say, I'm throwing an error just because I can. Come into the action filter, and this is where you'd want to do all your logging. Click F5, and it's going to go off to the umbrella error. But if you didn't want to have to put that attribute on all actions and all controllers, you can throw it into a, a, a global filter. So in order to do that, I'll take the attribute off here, and I'll go into my global file. And under my register global filters, OK, we're adding a new global filter. So global filters just means that if you don't provide a, a filter provider, this is just going to execute on all actions, all controllers. So with filter providers, you can say, I might only want this to be logging under like debug mode, or you know, when you're running on the local host, something like that, whatever you guys want to do. But global filters are just a fantastic thing to know, and they're only in MVC3. So I'll run this now, and we all know it's going to fail, but now, Every action, if it fails, it's going to have this attribute on it. So throwing an error, and it's still going to get into the action, the action filter. So that's pretty cool. But as always, when you're doing error handling, do everything like the final piece of work in the uh, application error in your global file. So eventually everything will be funneled down into this. Now, the, the, the error that we were throwing before, back here, just throw an error. If, I, if the user can't find that action, that, that action uh, filter will never be executed. So eventually, everything's coming back into application error. So this is where you want to do most of your logging in here. And that's what we were doing at ANZ. Most of our logging's in here, uh, because eventually, everything's going to get funneled through here. The user will see a pretty page. Bob's your uncle. That's it. Yep. You know what? I've already done that. I will show you the URL at the end. It's a cool URL, too. <laughs> I'll just take that out. I'm going to take out the error handling in this because there's certain things that I want to fail, and the error handling will automatically just take over, so I'm just going to do that. All right. So again, like handling errors is, is like is the biggest thing that you need to get right. I mean, this is really, really basic stuff, but if you can't capture errors, and especially in a bank, if things go wrong, you know, someone's gonna get fired. So we need to know when things aren't working. So it's really, really important that you get things done right. All right, handling Ajax errors is a little bit different. The thing with Ajax errors is, um, like when you use web forms and you use an update panel, as much as I hate the update panel, it does, uh, like it, it encapsulates, encapsulates a lot of the things that you, know, you don't have to do. So it you know, throws up errors, does all that sort of stuff to the user. In MVC, if you get an Ajax error, things fail silently. And there's nothing worse in a, um, a banking environment things, when uh, things fail silently, like the user just sitting there going, um, yeah, I'm not sure what's happened.
but Ajax errors need to be handled with care. So uh, we'll have a look at this. So I've got, a, um, got two buttons on here. The grey one is going to transfer $1 million to my account. The red one is going to try and transfer money from your account into my account. But you guys don't want that to happen. So just to prove it's working, hey, I've just transferred $1 million. It's really, really cool. But if I click on the red button, nothing happens. So if we just have a look at the code, Put a breakpoint on this, just to prove it's working, or not working, I should say. It's going to throw an error. Things are failing on the server, and the money's just gone. No one, and no one knows. We don't know what's happened. The user doesn't know what's happened, and they're just going to keep, keep on clicking that button, and they're going to get furious. So what we need to do is we need to create a, another action filter that returns a JSON result. That's all. That's all we need to do. So I'll just stop this. And now I've got another uh, bit of code that I've already got created. It's called handle JSON exception. So this is going to do exactly what I want it to do. So basically, again, another class derived from action filter attribute. And we're overriding the on action executed. So this is going to happen once we're trying to get a result from the action. So all this is doing, it's very, very basic. We're just seeing, is this an Ajax request? Because I only want this to work or execute when it's Ajax. If it's anything else, don't do anything. And we've actually got an exception. So we're returning a new status code. So what we were doing at the bank was, uh, we were actually returning a status code of 666 and the devil's number. So whenever we got that, we knew something really bad was wrong. So <laughs> we were returning 666, and in our result, we're just returning a, a JSON result. And for the demo, I'm returning the uh, message. Like, you obviously don't do this in real life, but I'm just returning a message and the stack trace. And I'm saying exception handled is true. So if you set that to false, We'll st we'll, we think we're going to be handling stuff, but back on the front end, nothing's going to happen anyway. So we'll run this now. It's going to throw an error. And it's going to come back and say, you haven't transferred $1 million. So whenever you do an Ajax, and like when you use MVC, everyone does Ajax these days. I mean, everyone loves jQuery here. Yeah, everyone loves jQuery. So you've got to be careful when you do Ajax stuff. So, and if you, do, if you, use, if you just get a, an action that returns a JSON result, you guys are going to be fine. So you can do all your logging, do all your things, but the most important thing is you're letting the user know something's happened. And that's the most important thing. All right, security. So I've sort of split uh, security into two different sections. So I'm just going to cover like um, the basics of uh, implementing a custom role provider and custom membership provider, which is, which is what we did at the bank to talk to our, uh, our LDAP. Um, we're still using all the built-in .NET goodness. We're not doing anything different here. Uh, but we do security a little bit differently in, in MVC. <coughs> Uh, in MVC, you can secure actions and controllers. So if you've got a, uh, a, a controller that you want open to everybody, but you want specific actions to be restricted to only certain people, you can do that very, very easily. And we're using uh, custom action filters to be able to do this. So let's have, a look at, uh, let's have a look at the project. So in my web config file, let's close all these windows down. So we have forms authentication turned on. 
everyone knows about role managers and you know memberships, all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to really go into this. But implementing a custom role provider, we just need to add a new section in our web config file, telling it we're going to be going off to a tech ed role provider. And the memberships, we're going to be using a tech ed membership provider. So if we have a look at that code, it's really, really basic. There's nothing to this. So in our membership provider, validate user, that's the one when someone tries to log into a website, that's where you say, you know, who is this person? Is this person who they say they is? So in this, I'm just simply returning, you know, if they pass in a username and password, let them in. I don't really care. <laughs> but you wouldn't want to do that. You, you wouldn't want to do that. And then the role provider, basically, this just, just returns, uh, basically, what roles this person's in. So this person is in the admin and general role. So to implement this, we'll have a look at the account controller. So I've got a, an action here. It's accepting a, a post request. And I've got an anti-forgery token. So we know it's only coming from this domain. So basically, we get a username password and a return URL where it's coming from, because most of the, some, a lot of the time you know where the person's coming from, but sometimes they're in the website and their session time's out, and they've got to go back to the front page, and then you want them, the user to go back where they are. So in here, we're simply validating the user. Um, I'm not going to show you this. I will show you that later. That's a little, uh, the nugget that I will show you later. Um, setting the authentication cookie and redirecting here. So, and if they're not, we're getting, you know, a login failed. So, if we have a look at everything. So, up until this point, you're going, you know, what's, what's new in here? I haven't really shown you what's new in here just yet. So, I'm going to log into the website. I'm going to authenticate with my great details. Person comes in, send the cookie, and I've logged into the website. So, if I want to restrict someone now, the old way of doing it in, in web forms, and if we have a look down here, is, is this. Everyone's used to, you know, is, is this user in this role? You know, that's the, you know, the old way of doing things. In MVC, you don't ever do that. Like, I've never known a project where someone's actually had to do that. I really haven't. And I think if you are doing that, there's probably a better way of doing it, personally. So, in MVC, what you do is you secure the actions by, again, using an action filter. So we've got an action called admin only. So I want to restrict this to admins only. So I forget what this one's called. Let's have a look at it. Uh, requires role. There we go. I'm going to pass it in a role, or role, sorry. So I'm saying whenever this action is executed, the person has to be in the admin role. And that's the right way of doing things in MVC. So just to prove what's going on, I'll put a breakpoint on here because eventually it's going to get back to this code. Log in. Let's take a breakpoint up there. So we've got, we're restricting uh, using the, the MVC way. So if we click, click in here, it's going to come in here. The requires role is kicked in. And we click on F11. It's going to come into our custom role provider and say, you know, is this person in this particular group? And the result is going to be null. Can everyone see that? The result's null. That means that this person can actually see this action. So we're just going to let them through. Yep, there's our admin page. But, if I close this down now, I've got a top secret action. So if I do requires role, Can't type today. Anyone guess what's going to happen? 
I'm not going to be able to see this. I'm going to get the 403 error. Well, that's what I, I hope happens. So I'll log in again. So there we go. We're going off to top secret. It's going to run get roles for user. And now the result is HTTP unauthorized result. So now we've actually secured the action and it knows who this person is, what roles they're in, and it's saying this person isn't allowed to see this. So it's going to return a new result and it's going to be redirecting to the no access page. So it's, uh, it's funny how many times uh, that I see uh, this sort of code like on uh, forums, like ASP.NET forums, and people are still going in MVC. Is this the way to do things? It's not. There's really, really better ways of doing things. If you can keep your actions lightweight, because that is the goal of MVC, keeping your actions really lightweight and, have, and having all your heavy code in like a service layer or a business layer somewhere else, then you're doing it right. So this is the way of securing things in, in MVC. Everyone understands it so far? Yeah, cool. All right, we're going to get into some more in interesting stuff now. Um, so a quick thing on the security. Yep. Um, over the web, there's always sometimes another controller and you might forget that, um, that you've gone and put an attribute because that controller's got a, a way into a critical yep. section of code. Yep. Um, so we still, we, we're using the action filters in combination with like security um, demands. Oh, okay, yep, um, yep. Things like that, just to make double check at the low level service calls uh, and double check and demand and the role as well. That's a good point, yeah, yeah. And like, you know, with, uh, with, with security, you always think you've covered everything and then you, you eventually find out you haven't covered everything, so that's actually a good point, yeah. Yes, yes, exactly the same, exactly the same, yeah. We're, we're actually using uh, NTFS authentication at work. So this is just for the demo. So it works exactly the same. Sorry, I didn't see who asked that question. Yeah, exactly the same. Yeah. All right, action filter ordering. <coughs> so everyone knows I'm banging on about action filters. Action filters are very, very important to, to use when you're using MVC. One of the most critical things when you're using action filters is to understand the order in which they're executed. So with an action filter, everyone's got the order attribute. So if you don't supply that, the action filter will be executed in an undetermined fashion. So even though you think you've got an action here and then you've got an attribute which says, you know, I'm going to run first, I'm going to run second, you never guarantee that things are going to run that way. And that uh, is one thing that caught us out in this project. We actually had... Uh, certain things that we wanted to happen in, in the correct order. And occasionally, it wouldn't work properly and we couldn't figure it out. And it's because we didn't have any orders on the actions. So it's very important to, to understand that. And also, security filters always run first. It's very, 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 very important to understand that. So let's have a look at our code base. So I've got uh, an action called one way. So I've got an attribute called first, and I've got one called second. So in another way, I'm going to go second first, and first second. So when you run this, if you don't set an order, you're never guaranteed that first will be executed first, and second will be executed second. So you get some strange errors. Or strange things happening, and it'll take you a while to figure out what the hell is going on. So, these these action filters are, are doing nothing more than just writing something to the response, just so we can see which one's being run first. So, we'll see if we can get this thing to to work like we don't want it to. Okay. So we've got one way. So we just executed one way and it's got second first and first second. So if we have a look at the code. One way. So we expected first, first, second, second. So straight away, you know, something's just not right. And uh, if we do 
the other way that actually ran as expected. So second ran first, first ran second, that's what we expect. But in this first one, you know, and that's not what we want. We want the first to go first, second to go second. So in order to do that, it's, it's dead simple. So there's an order attribute on this. Order equals one. So ordering starts at zero. So if you omit zero, it'll obviously go up to one, two, three, four. So we'll start at zero and I'll put that to one and vice versa. So now things will work out exactly as we expect. So I'll click on one way first. So I'm here first, I'm here second, and now second runs first, first runs second. So it's really, really important when you're using action filters to, to always specify in order, otherwise you'll get screwed up. But security always runs before anything else. So if we've got this sort of scenario, where we've got authentication wins, I can just copy this. And I'll get my other action, which I can never remember, check permissions. So I can set the order in here. So I'm going to go order equals two. So if we check, if we check, check permissions. Again, that's just going to write out what we've got in the message. So I better supply a message before I forget. Uh, I am checking security first. So even though we've, we've actually set second to go first, first to go second, and check permissions to go third. In actual fact, that's not the way it's going to execute. So this is going to be executed first, then it's going to go second and first. So whenever you create an action filter that derives from authorized attribute, it's king. It's going to run first all the time. And if you don't know this, you will screw yourself up. Yeah, you can specify an order in them as well. So you want to do that as well. It, it runs the global filters first, and then it'll run these second. Yeah. So, oh, you know what? I need to log into the website for this to work, sorry. Log in again. So we've got our authentication wins. So there we go. So we're checking security first. Second is first. Second is second, sorry. And first is third. So that's what we expect. And someone in New Zealand asked me a, uh, a question, which I've actually done for this one. They said, what happens if you've got um, two authorization action filters on there? Which one runs first? So it, it obeys the same order. So it'll start off at zero first, one, and then so on and so on. So if we've got this sort of scenario, so I'm going to put that in as one, or well, I'll put that in as three, sorry. So what will happen is, because this one has a higher order, that's going to run first, and then this one will run second. Sorry, what's... What determines the order? It's undetermined. You can never be guaranteed which one will be executed first. It, if you check the MSDN documentation, it actually says if you omit the order, it's an un, undetermined order. So, yeah, anybody's guess. So I'll just see if I can run this without having to log in again. So I'm checking security first, 
I'm checking, checking the security second. Then we've got our second one running third and the first one running last. So it's just always important to remember that when you're, when you're dealing with action filters, always specify a, an order. Always do it. And just be aware that when you're running uh, security with action filters, they'll always run first. And they always obey the order as well. So just some things you need to remember, otherwise you'll get caught out. All good? Yep. Yes, you should. Yeah, yeah. You should. You should always, always, always specify an order when you when you're working with anything. Uh, yep. Sorry, just another question. Yep. It bugs out when the security one stops the chain. Or it it bugs out. Like return, like if you don't have the permission to stop the security out. Oh yeah, 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 and yeah. How would you want to combine the JSON result error, nice error again between action filter and security to return an answer? Uh. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not sure how you'd, you'd want to be handling that one. I, we've never. I don't think I've ever come across a situation where I needed to do, to do you know, uh, that like a, a JSON. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, someone else had a quick. Uh, yeah. Yep. Yes. Security always wins. Security always wins. So security always wins. Uh, yep. Uh, uh, yep. Some. Just wanted to add something to what one of the guys said that exception filters always run, regardless of what happens. The exception filters always run. So eventually everything. So the authentication failure, your JSON exception filter is actually going to pick that up and return a good error to you. Uh, well, so, so the question was will the exception filters always run? Um, they will always run, but this is a really good case of why you'd want to have your last line of defense in here, like your application error. So that way you can always be guaranteed that you know, something's going to be logged. So um, I don't actually, uh, that's, that's actually a good question. So maybe we could, I th I'm pretty sure it's always run, pretty sure it's always run, but I need to actually check. So maybe we could have a look later. Someone else had a question? Yeah. Sorry, what was the question? If oh, if we had multiple roles that we wanted to let in, oh, we just add multiple roles to that string. So if we, so the question was, if we had multiple roles that we wanted to allow into an action, is that the question? Yep. So if we go back into our account controller. So here we've got top secret, so that's currently only letting users of the top secret admin, sorry, the top secret role in. So we can put in here uh, the cat sat on the mat. So that would make sure that only people in those two groups get access to this. That's how we do it. There's, it's exactly the same as, uh, as um, like if you're doing is user and role. Oh, it's, you've, you've got to be in one or the other. So if you're in one, you'll get in. Yeah. Sorry, we should keep moving, guys. We've got like a, a lot of things to get covered in this. So good questions. Come and see me later and we'll, we'll ask, we'll, you know, ask away before the party starts. <laughs> All right. So just remember, action filters, orders, ordering is very important, and security always runs first. All right, handling multiple form posts. We actually had this at, uh, at work where we had one form, multiple submit buttons. Now, don't ask why, but we actually had that at work. Um, the solution to this, uh, I think we came up with uh, an elegant solution. Uh, not originally, we came up with quite a bad solution first. But the problem is that when you've got multiple submit buttons, they're all just sent up. So you actually have to try and figure out which one was uh, the, the one that submitted everything. So I'll just show you what we did first. And then I'll show you how, by using the action method selector attribute, we did a quite an elegant solution for this. 
And uh, I'll come back to hijacking the form. So that's when we're trying to post the form via an Ajax post. So you've got to do something completely differently. So if we have a look at this. Now you know what? I'll have to run this. Okay. So I've got a, an action called post data. Now this is very similar to what we had at work. And we had a, uh, a string called delete, a string called save, because that was the two actions that the user could um, submit on the form. And just for the demo, we've got like a given name and surname, which is some input fields that are being passed up in the form. So if I have a look at what's going on here, So I'll just fill something in, and we're clicking save. So we'll see that delete is null, and save is, is being passed in. So this is where you could go, you know, if delete is equal to null, then go down the delete route, otherwise go down the save route. So all we're doing is we're just um, stuffing something into the view bag, which is saying, we clicked on save, and just to prove it's, it's doing exactly what it's doing, now delete has got the string that's being passed up, and save is going to be null. So you know, when we were doing this, we thought, oh, you know, this is pretty cool. But again, you don't want to clutter your actions with this sort of crap. You want to do something a little bit more elegantly. So again, action filters. Action filter was the answer to this. So I'll close that down, and I'll open up my text file with the bunch of code I've got in here. So I'm going to take that out. And now we're doing things a little more elegantly. So now we've got one action which is saving, one action which is, which is deleting. But we've still got one form post going back to the one URL. So the way to handle that is by using the action name attribute. So basically, action name says even though you've got a, an action called save, the user will be able to get to this via post data. So they could go slash multiple submit slash Instead of going uh, slash multiple submit slash save, they're going multiple submit slash post data. And that's the way you can sort of obscure your actions if you want to do that. It's really, really handy to know. But how do you know? Like we've got one URL with two requests coming in. How, how can you differentiate between the two? So this is where we've got a, a button action filter. So if we have a look at this, whoop, I don't want that. So in this, we're actually. De declare, uh, sorry, deriving from the action method selector attribute. That's a mouthful. So basically, you know child action only in MVC3? So you can actually uh, restrict actions through child actions. So I'm not going to go into what child actions are. But basically, it's, it's using this exact same code. So when you derive from action method selector attribute, you can intercept the request even before anything's been executed. So you can do stuff like, uh, you know, is this an Ajax post? Um, is this a, a, a HTTP GET post? Like, is this a, a put? Is a post? You can do all sorts of things, or whatever you guys want to do. But this intercepts a request way, 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 way early in the pipeline. So all we're doing is we've got a string called button name, and I'm just checking the value providers. So the value provider will have, you know, stuff like the the child action. Um, uh, We'll have like the forms, all the form values, a couple other value providers being passed up. But we can basically just say, is our button name that we set in our code the same that's being passed up in the form? So I'll just show you in code because it's much easier to see what's happening in here. So I'll put a breakpoint on that. And I'll put a breakpoint on these two. So over here we've got button and we're setting, setting button name to save and button name to delete. So what's going to happen is when this user, me, submits the form, the name of the submit button will be sent up in the form. And that's the way we can differentiate between which button is being posted, which button has posted the form. So run this. So 
So multiple submit buttons. Put something in and click on save. So immediately it's coming in. Button name is set to save because we've set that over here. And if we check the value providers, so the value provider, we've got the, the child action value provider, the form value, that's the one that we're really, really interested in, uh, routing data, query string data, and uh, our HTTP file collection. So if I have a look at the, uh, the forms that are being sent up, form values, sorry. So we've got save just there. So that's sent up in the form request. So that's how I know that this is a save request, not a delete request. And this is returning a bool. So it's going to say, have you got, can you run this? Do you meet this like filter? Yes, you do. So I'm going to allow you to run it. So this is going to run twice because I've got delete as well. And it's going to come in, hit save, and it's got a given name, surname. And that way I know it's a save submit. So if I hit delete now, it's going to jump back into the button attribute. So again, it's going to run twice. So, so there's save, there's delete. Now it's going to come into my delete action. And that's a, a very, very elegant way, I think, of, uh, of, of handling that sort of situation. So instead of cluttering our action with a lot of if-else statements, again, decorating it with, a, with an action filter, and nice and simple. Does everyone understand that concept, what was happening just then? Yeah. Yep. So like, no, no. So what we're trying to do is we've got one form, multiple actions. So if we have a look at the the source, so we've got uh, one form and it's going off to post data. But we want to instead of cluttering, you know, if if delete is equal to null, then do this or do this. Um, trying to keep the actions nice and elegant. So that way we can just post off to one URL, and that way we know exactly which, which, which action the user is, is trying to do. Okay, so you can... Just avoiding multiple forms. Uh, yes, 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 yes. And we, we, had, we had a situation at work where we needed to do this, and we were trying to think of something where, you know, we're trying to keep the actions nice and, nice and simple. Okay. I haven't done Ajax in this yet. That's next. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yep. Yeah. Sorry, just question. If I was building an action or Lambda Express using the URI builder, would it honor the action name attribute? Yes. Yep. Yep. Uh, yep. Why both? Why they're both executing? Because we've got that decorated on both actions. Oh, that's just the way the framework is. You've, I've, I've got this decorated. Oh, sorry, you can't see that. But because I've got this in two different places, it's going to be executing save and then delete. They can't. Why would they? Why would they both equal true? Oh, well, then you shouldn't be a programmer. <laughs> I mean, you, 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 uh, if, if, you, if you don't know what you're doing, yes, they will both equal true, but uh, I've, I've never, I've, you, you just make sure you don't do that. <laughs> you've, got, you've got to think, you've really got to think. Yeah, uh, that's just, I mean, because we've decorated our actions with this multiple times, it's going to be executed multiple times. So if we had this on 10 different actions, that would be executing 10 different times. There you go. And the, and the, and the message with that is you're an idiot. You know, <laughs> don't do this. <laughs> but yeah. But that's, that's one way we did this. So uh, if you wanted to um, post the form via Ajax, you need to do things a little, little, little bit differently. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of this. 
go back into my example page. And again, exactly the same code, except in this time we're just returning a, a, a JSON result. That's all. That's the only difference. So if I go back into my other page down here, and I do this. So with this example, what we're going to do is we're going to post the form via Ajax. So the thing to be wary of is when you post via Ajax, only successful controls will be serialized in the string. So input buttons aren't successful controls, so they'll never get up there. So just to see what's actually happening. I'll put a breakpoint on here and on here. And we've still got one on button, button attribute. So we're going back off to the same URL. So nothing's different. We're just going via the, uh, the Ajax to post the form. That's all. <coughs> so I'll just fill in something. Clicking on Save. Now if we have a look at our value provider, the button name is save, but the value provider, if we have a look at the form value collection, we'll see we've got our any forgery token, given name, surname, but no button. Because the, the submit button is not a successful control, so it will never get up there. So what you need to do if you're doing this sort of stuff with Ajax, you need to, uh, on the sly, input in a hidden, hidden input control. So that's sent up, so you'll know exactly what, what's happening. So this is exactly what we did. So what's happening is whenever the submit button is clicked, what I'm doing is I'm removing any control that's named save, any control that's named delete, and uh, in the first form, because I've only got one form here, I'm inserting a hidden, hidden input control. And the name of it will be what, what the user is trying to do. So it'll either be save or delete. So that value that you see there will be either delete or save. And that's it. That's all it's doing. So if we run this now, and I'm going to open up Firebug to see what's happening here. So I'll just type something in there. Click Save. So Save is coming up. So if we have a look at the value provider now and the form value collection, we've got Save there now. So if we, if we just let this run now, it'll be this, exactly the same for the delete, but I won't bother showing you that. It's going to come back into Save and it knows exactly what's happening. But if we go and have a look in here, I'll zoom in after I find it. So that's, that's the magic, that's all it's doing. So currently, when the page loads, there is no hidden form, because we just don't need it. But when they click on Submit, that's injecting that into the form. And because that is a successful control, that'll be sent up there. So that way we can differentiate between save, delete, or, whether, or whatever, whatever else you want to do. Yep? I, so the question was, can you not change the action of the form? I want it to go back to the one URL. That's, all, that's what we were trying to achieve with this. So this is the only way we could get it to work when we were um, doing uh, post fire Ajax. So if we have a look, if we have a look at the page when it's just loading, you'll see there is no hidden input. We've got our two submit buttons, but we need to inject something into form so it knows what's happening. So just something to be aware of if you want to do this. I mean, a lot of the time you won't need this, but sometimes you do. 
and you and just just know there is elegant solutions to really, some really bad problems. Yep. Yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, well, if if you weren't so the question was if you had an authorized attribute on this, yeah. how would you know which one is is? Well, should we do it now and check? Because I'm not exactly sure of that. Because we didn't do that. Because when someone actually, when the user was doing this, they were already logged into the website. So. There you go. Good, an good answer. I don't need to do anything now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so a lot of the time you won't need to do this, like have one form, multiple submit buttons, but this is one way of doing it. So instead of doing, you know, if delete is equal to null, you don't want to do that. Just do this. It's really cool. <laughs> All right. We're running out of time. Downloading files. So, <clears throat> Downloading files in MVC is a little bit different to, to uh, web forms because everything points back to an action, not a, a, a relative file. So what the business wanted in this uh, particular scenario was um, they wanted to be uh, like have, it's almost like a, a RESTful style where they could say, uh, give me John Smith, this is his account number, return me his bank details or something like that. So they wanted to be able to structure almost like a dynamic URL, and just return files from that. So when we, we were trying to figure this out, we thought, oh my god, what do we, what do, we do here? So the way, we, the way we handled this was we actually wrote a controller action invoker. So for anyone who's not actually dealt with the controller action invoker, this is a really, really cool class that is basically the parent of your controller. So the requests come in. So when you say, uh, like, slash account slash login, the control action evoker is the guy that's saying, this guy wants to log in action, submit this up. So I'll show you what, what we were doing. So something very, very similar to this. We had, like in this example, we've got two actions, get people CSV, so that's just, just returning a, a file I've got on my hard disk, and we've got get more people XML. So if I run this now, you guys can guess what's going to happen. I'll turn off Firebug. So running those two actions, just going to return a CSV file. Nothing uh, too extraordinary about that. But basically they wanted something where they could go, instead of reporting, they wanted to say uh, maybe people slash Smith slash one slash bank details, something like that. But it had to be, had to be dynamic. That was, what, that, was the, uh, that was the requirement. So what we implemented was a, a custom action invoker, a controller action invoker, sorry. So to get this to work, we needed to construct a URL. So where's my examples? Go back into our global file. And under our routes, we had something like this where people could request get people. And for this demo, I haven't expanded everything that we did. But they could request get people and pass in a format. So if they wanted all the John Smiths in a CSV file or all the John Smiths in a, like a HTML file or a text file, whatever, they could just run this query. And we would do something really, really cool with that. So, this is going to be running the reporting controller and an action called get people. So in here, what we did was something exactly like this. So in our constructor, we're passing in a new controller action evoker called export result invoker. So it's saying whenever you request this reporting, contro this contr reporting controller, use this invoker. So we want to in intercept those requests and do something really, really special with this. So get people, you'll notice it's returning an object. Now most of the time in MVC you return an action result. But I don't want to do that. I want to return an object. 
And it all makes sense, trust me, it will all make sense. So if we have a look at this class, so what we've got is just a normal class deriving from controller action invoker, and the method that we want to override is create action result. So when the action's executed, after, it, after it's executed, we're going to say, give me the result of that. So it could be like a, a list of people, one person, it could be anything that your action returns. But after that, we can do some special stuff to it. So what we were doing was the, the action return value, which is an object. So that will hold whatever your action is going to be returning. So that's your collection of people, your person. And when we get down in here, we can check the routing data. And that's checking, checking format. So if we go back into our global file, if I can ever find it, we've specified a format. So this is where they can go get people slash CSV, get people slash XML, get people slash John Smith slash CSV, something like that. So they wanted to be able to return multiple formats from the one URL. So in here, what we're doing is seeing if there's a, a format being passed in. And we're doing something very similar to this. Don't hold this against me, but we're doing something very similar to this, where we're returning uh, the, uh, the result into a data table, and we're doing some special stuff to this. So if it was CSV, we had something like a CSV action result, where we'd take the collection and return some CSV data. Uh, XML, getting a memory stream, dumping it out. <coughs> Text, we've got some other proprietary formats uh, that I can't show you, but we were doing some cool stuff with this. So if I put a breakpoint on here, and I'll put a breakpoint on here and on here. And we'll see some of the cool stuff you can do with the controller action invoker. So we're coming into our constructor and we're saying, don't use the normal control action invoker, use my one. And it's going to come in here. We don't have anything in our, uh, well, we do have a, a view result. But it's just going to come in here. And if, the act if this object meets or matches an action result, just return it. So it's going to come in here. So now, if you can see this. We've got the URL get people slash CSV. And in there, we've got get people slash XML. So it was something very, very similar to this where they could go, you know, get person slash John Smith slash so and so slash CSV. So if we ran this now, we're going to come into our action first because nothing's been executed. So we're returning a list of employees. I'll run this. Now it's gotten back into our custom controller action invoker. And now action the action return value is our collection of customers. <coughs> so from there, oh, sorry, I clicked F5, guys, sorry. I'll step through this now. Action result is no, null, so it's going to come in. It knows we've got a format because the format is slash CSV. And from there, we can go into our CSV case and just return some CSV data. Simple as that. And XML, it's exactly the same. Returning some data. The action return value is our collection of customers. And the format's XML. So it's just going to go through, return some XML. And <clears throat> that was one way we came up with this solution. So the controller action invoker is really, really cool when you want to like, take complete control over, over what your actions are returning. So a lot of the time, you won't need to go down to this level. But when you do, this is a really, really cool class to use. Uh, yep, question? Uh, so the question was, why didn't we create a custom action? A custom result type, and then take that generic object into a data source and 
we didn't think of it. We just didn't think of it. <laughs> I can't lie to you, we just didn't think of it. We just thought this way was pretty cool. Yeah. And we, you know, we want to do cool code too, so yeah. <laughs> yep, question? Yeah, so. No, so when you do it, when you do it for the controller, it, it, it works for the whole controller. Yes, you, yes, you could, yeah. But we wanted it to run for the whole, for the whole controller. Well, let's move on, guys. Uh, we've got two more things to do, and I'm running out of time. So we're getting down to some really, really cool stuff now. This is what you've all been waiting for. Authentication tip, okay. So, uh, you know when someone logs into your website, you've always got to display, uh, sorry, display something to the user which says, you know, uh, John Smith, you're in department XYZ. A lot of the time that comes from a database. Um, when you're using authentication, there is something called user data, which I think a lot of people have actually forgotten, forgotten about. And it's basically where you can stuff in a, a string into the authentication cookie that lives on the client, so that can hold something you know, about the user which is like their first name department, display that to the screen without actually going back to the database all the time to, to get some data. So this is this gold nugget that I was telling you about. So if we have a look at our, our account controller, so I'm just going to comment this out. The nugget for later. Ooh, everyone <laughs> loves this. Okay, so what I've got, or what, I, what we created was a static class called security provider, and we've got a static method called set details. So we're passing in the username that the user logs in with, and the user data. So user data, for me, it's just hello Malcolm from ANZ. So a lot of the time this will be coming from a database, so for every page, you'd want to you know, go up to the database, do this. Sometimes people put this, put this sort of stuff in the session. Don't put this in the session. I hate the session. I really, really do. I really do. Just store something in there which can uniquely identify, you, uh, uniquely identify the user, like an ID. And that's it. Nothing else. So if we have a look at set details, what this is doing, we're setting the authentication cookie here, so we know that this person who logs in, we've, we're setting the cookie so we know exactly who they are. And all we're doing basically is just creating a new cookie, a new authentication ticket. So this is, if you're doing forms authentication by hand, this is how you do this. So the forms authentication ticket, when you create this, one of the parameters is actually called user data. So if I can zoom in. No, that didn't really work. Let's see if I can zoom in and show you guys. It's just there. User data is a string. So in here, you can stuff anything. Like, don't stuff some, some, something like a, a credit card or anything like that. But <laughs> put something in that uniquely, you know, is, is unique to the user, like their name, something that you want displayed on the screen. And this way, you don't have to go back to the database every time you want to display this. You just go back to the cookie, and that's it. So after that, you encrypt it, put it back in the cookies, and Bob's your uncle. So if we have a look at this in action, I've got a page called index. And in here, I've got a partial view, which is just rendering something called logged in user. So everyone knows in MVC, if you have a, a partial view, if you start it with underscore, you can never serve this up by the URL. It has to be a partial, partial call, something you should know. So if we have a look at logged in user, all this is doing is just running security provider get details. So if we have a look at get details, all this is doing is it's just asking, are you authenticated? Yep, come in, get the uh, identity of the user and just return the user data. And that's it, nothing really complex, but it's amazing how many people actually forget about this stuff. So if we just run this, does everyone, is everyone okay if we run a little bit over time? Because I've got one other thing to show you guys. All right, so I'm going to log in. It's 
It's going to come through. So it already knows what, that we've been validated. So we'll come into our code. Got our username. So set, a, set auth cookie. So we've set the authentication cookie. So everything's good. Everything's, real, everything's kosher. So now we're going to go and create a new cookie, a new, tic new ticket. And in this new ticket, we're stuffing the user data, encrypting it, setting it back. And now our view is loaded. So it's going to come in and say, you know, are you authenticated? Yes. Come down, get the forms authentication. And in forms authentication, we've got the ticket. And under there, we've got user data. And uh, it didn't work. So we've got hello, Malcolm from ANZ. So this is the way that we output on the screen a lot of the information that was unique to the user, that, so we didn't have to go back to the database all the time. So it saved a, 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 big, a big amount of performance, because we've got a lot of pages. And uh, this is one really, really cool way of getting around, getting around this issue. So, Use the data. Remember it, guys. Remember it. All right, we've got one more demo to show you, and then we can give away our prize. <coughs> Routing constraints. All right. Everyone wants beautiful URLs, don't we? Yep, everyone does. Um, in banks, sometimes you get some shocking URLs, and uh, this is what we did to sort of beautify some of our URLs. So we had something similar to this. So if we can click down to route constraints, our typical page where we've got, the we'll zoom in so you can see that, we've got a URL where we're going off to uh, route constraints, route constraints slash update form slash one. So we're going to go off to the update form, edit this person, and, and do exactly what we're thinking. Um, same for delete. I'll show you in IE. For some reason, the, uh, the status bar isn't showing up on these. I think it's just my computer. But if we hover over delete, everyone can see that. So we've got, well, we had. <laughs> we had route constraints slash delete slash one. Like, there's nothing wrong with that, with that URL. But you know, I want to make it pretty. I want to be able to do something like sort of route constraints. I want to be able to do something like uh, you know, maybe um, car slash one. So from that URL, I want to be able to say, I don't want to say whether it's, this is an, a, a post, a get, or whatever it is. I want, this, I want the framework to work this out by itself. So routing constraints, we can actually set constraints in routing constraints. So what we did was something like this. <coughs> We actually did something like this, where we create a number of uh, constraints, and we'd say, if someone requests route constraints slash insert, check the actual verb that's being used. So with, with HTTP, you've got uh, get, post, put, and delete. They're the, they're the five verbs. So you can switch between the verbs to say, you go off to this uh, action, you go off to this action, and it's all depending on the verb. So in constraints, uh, it doesn't have to be the verb. You can say whether the whether the um, the value being passed in is an integer. Maybe you want to make sure that the action only accepts integers. You might want to have a, a regular expression or something running in here. But with this, we wanted to be able to check what the the post, what the verb, sorry, the the verb value was. So in in update. So if someone requests route constraints slash update, we're going to say this is only accessible via a post. So it's going to be going off to the uh, the post action. If it's a delete, they'll have route constraint slash ID, and the verb coming up is a delete. We can go route constraint slash new, so someone wants to input a, a new value into the form. So it's going to be going off to insert form, and the, the verb is only a get. So if we see all of this in action, this is one way of making some beautiful URLs.
Come in here now. And we'll say now, instead of route constraint slash uh, update form slash one, we've got route constraint slash one. So it just knows, well, it will know that this is a, uh, a get, so it needs to run the get actions. So if I have a look at this form, or at the source, I've got one form, which is a, a get method in here. It didn't work. Let's do the right one. So there's our get, and we've got a, uh, an input button, and that's the insert, sorry. So in here, this is the one that I want. So it's going off to a route constraints, route constraints slash uh, one, and it's a post. So that way I know they're going to be doing a post on this, and this is, the, this is what's doing all the magic. So we're outputting the, the method override in here, and it's a delete. So to, in order to get that in your forms, what you need to do in MVC is just this one line of code. So we're outputting a HTTP method override. So we've got a number of different options to us when we do this. So we've got deletes. As you can all guess, we've got gets, heads, put, post, and put. So this is the way that we can say when someone submits this form, the verb's going to come up, and we can, we can really control where our, our actions are going to go. And uh, if we have a look at the controller, just a normal control. There's nothing really, really happening here, but everything's happening through our routing. So if I have a look at our, I'll just put some breakpoints on here. So when we click on edit, it knows to go off to this, this update form method. And if we have a look at the global file, it's running this route because it's being sent up with a get. And that's it. There's nothing really, really to this. Does that make sense, guys? Am I explaining everything correctly? So we can come in here, do everything we need to do. There's our update. So it's going to go and set everything. Uh, inserts. Our URL is route constraint slash new. So through the routing, it knew exactly what to do. So it just ran that. So when someone requested route constraint slash new, and it's a get, it's, it's going off to the insert form. And that's it. That's one way of making some really, really cool URLs. So you can obviously expand this uh, throughout your project, but um, constraints are really, really cool. And if, oh, I, sorry, I am really, really running out of time. So if anyone wants to see this demo or come up and ask some questions, just come up and see me later or after this, before the party. But we're just using the verb to change the constraints, and that's it. That's all we're doing. Um, so what's everyone learned today? Hopefully... Uh, uh, there wasn't too much that I covered in this session because uh, a lot of the time people come to sessions and they just don't take everything in because there's, there's so much content. But uh, we showed you how to do the uh, exception handling, AJAX errors, uh, implementing security, action filters. Remember the ordering and the security action filters always run first. It's important to remember. Uh, showed you the controller action invoker, which is really cool, and also some routing constraints. So uh, that's it. Now the URL, if you want this demo, um, it's going off to tinyurl.com slash web slash web306. Uh, that's my email address if anyone needs to uh, contact me. That's on Twitter. Now, where is the... Where are these? Where are the business cards? Can I go back? Yep. All right. Oh, plenty of cards in here. Someone random want to come up and uh, pick, pick out the winner? Uh, yes, you. All right.
So we'll just store these. Stay around, guys. You might win something. Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson. You won. Congratulations. Thanks a lot, guys. Enjoy the party tonight.